Hello, thank you for joining the webinar today. We're going to give folks another minute or so uh, to, to uh, log in, and then we're going to get started uh, just after that. Okay, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 uh, Better Building Summer webinar series. Uh, this series is dedicated to bringing you uh, latest actionable insights um, from leading industry experts, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, this, this series is an annual series, and it's a chance to explore topics, uh, technologies, and trends that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate decarbonization, as well as energy efficiency. Uh, so today's webinar uh, is called uh, Paying the Price. <clears throat> uh, how does <clears throat> internal carbon pricing support emissions reduction? And before we dive in, we just want to go over a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, so uh, like, like most of our webinars, today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, and you'll get a follow-up note uh, via email about when that's available, uh, when the recording and the slides are available, if you want to share that with your colleagues. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, as attendees, you'll be, you'll be in listen-only mode. Uh, so your microphones will be muted. But when we do get to the end and get to a Q&A uh, uh, section, you know, you'll be able to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you how to, how to uh, put, put questions in the Q&A so, so you can get those answered. Uh, my, my name is Paul Lamar. I'm one of the technical account managers under the, um, the, the Better Plans program. And, uh, and and the be better climate challenge as well. Uh, and I've been with the program uh, since it started back in 2009. Been working with partners on you know energy metrics and, and helping them with uh, their their regression models, setting up their uh, energy management systems like the ISO 50001, uh, and, and in general, been working with them on on everything they need to do to to start working towards their goals. Uh, I also uh, help a, a lot with uh, treasure hunts and energy assessments. I've done quite a few of those, both in, in U.S. and in Europe. And also, uh, broader background, uh, I, I've been working for many, many years in uh, combined heat and power, uh, uh, renewable integration, and, um, and interconnection, as well as just general uh, industrial energy efficiency. So uh, with that, uh, I want to go ahead and go through what our agenda is going to look like today. <clears throat> so first, we're going to go through a few uh, introductory background uh, points about what, what we're seeing in the area of internal carbon pricing. And, uh, and then we got, we've got a couple polls. We've got a couple on the front end, a couple on the back end, where we want to ask our attendees here, you know, where, where, where do you sit on this issue? And that's going to be interesting for everybody to see. Um, and then, then we have some fantastic partner presentations. We've got um, we've got um, a team from uh, Saint Gobain. We got we've got uh, Cummins and we've got Camores all here to tell us where they are in this issue and what they've done about it thus far. Uh, and, and it's really going to be interesting to see a variety of different perspectives on that. <clears throat> and then we'll we'll wrap up after that with a couple more polls. Uh, uh, around this topic, and then finally open it up to Q and A, uh, and then after that we'll we'll just uh, conclude the webinar. So just just a quick background on this this topic, and and a lot of what we've uh, gathered on this this topic has been based on you know just early discussions with them. Um, with our partners on where they are when they're looking towards, you know, setting these these uh, long term but but very significant GHG reduction goals. You know, most of our better climate challenge partners have goals around 50% reductions by 2030, uh, and that's that's a, a huge commitment. And and even even our our better plants and better buildings partners, while they may not have a commitment quite that. 
uh, that high yet. You know, a lot of them are working towards that and also have very aggressive goals in that area. So it's it's a big challenge, particularly when you look at the fact that 2030 is only maybe seven seven years away. So um, what we've heard is that through you know the, the emissions reductions planning that that our our partners are doing, you know, one of the obvious concerns is are are we going to be able to get enough reductions when we look at our projects and and and, um, and, and particularly. One of the things that we were running up against is, you know, if if we're looking at just doing it on the basis of energy cost savings alone, that's that could be very challenging. So one of the things that that's been, you know, come up in discussions is is you know whether you know the, the conventional kind of capital budgeting process that that uh, organizations use, you know, for for energy projects, you know, whether that's going to um, to stand up or, or or what really is probably going to happen it's going to likely require some revisions uh, particularly if those if there's not a lot of low hanging fruit to reach that those goals let's see so so there were a number of options that came up in our discussions and uh, and a lot, some of these are really you know just kind of offshoots of of what our partners were looking at to to uh, you know attain their their energy goals you know and and these are you know steps like you know looking at a longer return on investment rate you know so maybe instead of a 3 year payback they're looking at a 5 year payback you know and that that certainly allows them would allow them to capture more projects, but does it really um, go as far as as hitting those levels of decarbonization? Uh, and, and similarly, you know, along the same lines, we've seen our partners, you know, look to set aside capital funds uh, and focus those on higher decarbonization projects. And you know, that that certainly would be effective, but is is it again gonna gonna be enough? And that's the issue uh, with those two measures. Um, and, and we do we do see a lot of our partners, particularly those that, that have more uh, uh, scope two exposure and less, or actually both both scope one and scope two, but the focus on electrification uh, and, and taking the the, the uh, uses that are scope one, if they those can be electrified, and then combining them with renewable electricity, that's certainly a way of of uh, encouraging funding because those projects may be may be more achievable when when we're looking at combining with renewables. Um, but but the final step, you know, what we see a lot of partners looking at is is really just integrating an internal cost of carbon. And and um, what we what we've seen is that the the kind of interest and progress towards this seems to be more tied around a few factors. One is uh, whether they are in you know some of the regulated markets like either Europe or California. Secondly, whether they have a a, a, a significant footprint in Europe, and then finally related to that is whether their parent organization is also in that in that European footprint. And so it seems to be tied uh, more to that, but that's just anecdotal information. Next slide, please. Uh, the, you know, most of our partners uh, uh, submit through the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, and, and this is a great platform to gather data um, and, and there's some uh, thousands of, you know, I think it's 8,000 or more corporate entities reporting uh, through this platform. Um, and uh, they, they did a, a, a analysis of their, their reporting information. Uh, and uh, at this point, it was looking at 2020 data, but uh, it was still updated from from they did a, a first look at it back in 2018. And what they what they showed is that when you look at the increase in organizations that are either either using uh, uh, internal price on carbon or planning to do so within the next two years, versus those that, that have no such plans, you know, there's a 50 percent increase just in those two years over organizations looking to head in that direction versus, you know, still high growth, but a much lower rate, you know, uh, uh, with those with no plans to adopt carbon pricing. So that the difference there is about 50% higher growth in, in the ones looking at internal price of carbon. And, you know, at the time they found that the median price was about uh, $25 uh, a metric ton CO2 equivalent. And you know that really at the time harmonized with the 2020 EU pricing on that. So so it's you know you can see that that that's a, a pretty strong benchmark for for companies looking to do that. 
that type of the, the internal carbon pricing, or at least it was at the time. Next slide, please. And, and on the topic of pricing benchmarks, you know, we mentioned the EU uh, pricing uh, for allowances there, and that that's, you know, it, 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 up until 2020, it was hovering around $25 a ton, but then we saw it, you know, uh, accelerate uh, and grow much higher and, uh, and, and get into the range of 60 and as high as 110 with a median of around $85 a metric ton uh, of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and the California market, though, is uh, similar similar growth, but a lower level of, of cost, uh, running from about eighteen dollars to thirty one dollars, uh, with a median around twenty four dollars. And then finally, another metric that's worth um, looking at is whether you it, it take the cost of of racks, you know, unbundled or compliance racks, you know, which gives you a pretty broad range, maybe seven dollars to thirty dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, and then apply that to the U.S. grid emissions factor, uh, then you can see that that equates to a range of about three to eleven dollars. So that's kind of like a low end benchmark for for what might constitute a, an internal um, price for carbon. Next slide, please. So just to to kind of recap, and then we obviously want to hear from our uh, our our uh, uh, presenters, because they're going to have a lot more uh, information on this. You know, what, what we're seeing is that, you know, organizations that we're working with through the BCC, as well as our other partners in better plants and better buildings are looking to reach significant levels of decarbonization. And, and that, that the, the tool of establishing an internal price of carbon appears to be you know, one of the leading ways to 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 build this into the capital approval approval process, and I think what we'll hear from our panelists is not not just for energy projects, but also you know corporate acquisitions or maybe evaluating their current footprint and things like that. So there's a, a wide range of uses of that, but really what we're focusing on is is kind of how how to uh, to reach those levels of decarbonization with with this uh, approach. Um, and, and and we do see that when you know there there's such a wide range, so it's really hard to pinpoint where you know someone might set a price. You know, uh, it could be anywhere from you know three to three hundred and ten. You know, but if you look at median prices, it narrows it a little bit, but it's still a really broad range of eighty to maybe eighty five dollars per metric ton of CO two equivalent, um, and that's based on anywhere from the price of Rex all the way up to the regulated markets of, of California or Europe. And then finally, you know, the timing when we look at, um, you know, what what it, what you need to do to to reach your 2030 goals, you know, points to, you know, if you're really going to try to avoid an implementation bottleneck, you know, and supply chain issues and on implementing projects that that this price, if it were in place within the next three to four years, that's going to be really, really helpful. Next slide, please. And um, and again, we'll hear more from our panelists on this. But you know what what we see are the internal the the uses of this practice are obviously you know in in the direct uh, capital budgeting process where a value can be placed on it, uh, which ties to the 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 quantity or the reduction in carbon emissions associated with the project, so that so that builds into the 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 rate of return of that. Of that capital uh, investment, uh, and um, so so therefore it places on equal footing with other projects that have some decarbonization benefit. Um, but but there are other ways to do it. One one we see partners that weren't weren't quite ready to take that step, and they were using it to to bring attention to investments to to kind of almost like a tiebreaker, you know, to to look at uh, investments, you know with their standard practice, but then have a second lens looking at, well, also what's the decarbonization impact financially of this project? And that, that you know, appears to be a good kind of uh, stepping stone into the first um, first bullet. And then finally, the, the other um, uses, you know, and these can be pretty broad and, and the CDP survey went into a lot of different ways to use it, but looking at, 
you know, influencing internal behaviors, you know, pointing out where, you know, uh, a high carbon impact or, or a high decarbonization impact um, actions might be taken within operations, for example, um, managing stakeholder expectations by, you know, pointing out where, you know, higher carbon impact or decarbonization impact uh, measures are, and then, and then obviously navigating the GHG regulations uh, allowing you to to place more emphasis on on uh, on achieving the levels of the regulations by looking at the the costs that are implicit in those markets. So, um, so that's that's uh, that's kind of our summary there. We want to turn it over to the presenters, but we first want to go over a little bit of uh, housekeeping. You know, we're we're going to be asking you to go over to the um, the Slido uh, platform, and that's um, that's our interactive platform for both the the Q and A and the polling. Uh, so so please uh, load that up either on uh, open a new browser window um, or or on your mobile phone. Um, uh, enter www.slido.com, and then when you get to that point, the, the event code is, as we show in here, is pound DOE. Um, and, and so, if you if you'd like to ask our panelists any questions, feel free to submit those questions in the Q and A feature. And then we're also going to have the polls uh, uh, teed up uh, in that platform. And so. Um, what we we have uh, a poll coming up now under the Slido platform, and we wanted to to learn uh, more about some some key topics from you. And this first one is, you know, what's the status of internal uh, carbon pricing within your organization? Uh, and so, obviously, we we would need you to go over to Slido to respond to that. And and you can see the results coming up uh, on the screen, which right now it appears that you know is pretty um, pretty much in favor of of uh, uh not using an internal price of carbon yet but we see we see more coming out uh on plans to adopt an internal price uh either either uh soon or during you know some some time frame but that's not known so so that's interesting uh that that um it's that much in favor of no plans to do it yet but the fact that we have a pretty pretty good attendance for this webinar seems to indicate that maybe that'll change in in the future and um so so that's where we are now and um we'll give it another uh moment or two to see where it ends up but it looks like it's still very much in favor of of um no plans on using it about two-thirds have no plans to use an internal price of carbon but still significant um 20 26 percent um Let's see, plan on adopting with the time frame or currently use it, and then uh, an additional 9% uh, plan to use it in the next two years. So, so that's the, the other third is, is somewhere in that, those measures. We should be just about ready to move on to the next poll. Okay, so for those of you, for the two thirds that were not using a, a carbon price, probably gonna be very simple to answer this one, but for others, what we're looking to find out is, is uh, how, how, how do you use it? Uh, would you use it directly in uh, capital budgeting uh, to determine return on investment or to bring focus on projects? Um, uh, you know, so in other words, to, to bring visibility to projects with a high decarbonization impact. And then finally, other uses not described above, which are, you know, some of the things we mentioned, you know, whether it's to, you know, manage stakeholder expectations to, to help uh, with, uh, you know, the GHG regulated markets or, or to, um, uh, to, to, to help uh, emphasize, you know, internal behaviors that might emphasize or, or might uh, impact your your uh, carbon impact. And so we we're seeing kind of a broad mix there of, of those three options. It looks like you know the the there seems to be more focus on actually using it directly in the capital budgeting process, but but still significant, you know, about the same level, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, looking at uh, using it, uh, actually, sorry, I got those reverse. More, more, more using it to bring focus, less using it directly in the process. But right now, those are pretty close to tied. 
we'll give that another moment and then we're going to turn it over to our panelists. And uh, while, while that's going through, uh, we uh, our three panelists that we're going to be, um, let's see, going through our, um, uh, so he here we are. Uh, we have from, from St. Gobain, we have Andy Mullen and Blair Sturm. Uh, and uh, and then and then we'll uh, switch over to Laura Jones of Commons, and then finally Sean Wool of of Camores. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, the the Saint Gobain team. Um, Andy Andy Mullen is uh, he's a results driven professional with 15 years of proven experience working in all facets of financial planning and analysis. He's an intuitive leader with a successful record of managing global projects with cross-functional teams. And Blair Sturm has been with St. Gobain for three and a half years and is currently the Senior Manager of Process Sustainability and Energy. And in his role, Blair leads the initiatives across uh, St. Gobain's North American uh, operation, assuring they have the necessary plans and support to achieve their 2030 interim sustainability goals, as well as the long-term goal to achieve net carbon, net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to, to Blair and Andy, and, and they'll step us through what, what they're doing in this, in this area. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'll go ahead and start off, and then I'll hand it to Andy to go into more detail on the financial side of things. If you could go to the next slide. Um, so to start, you know, who is St. Gobain? Um, you know, for those who don't know, um, we're one of the largest building products and materials companies. Um, we're headquarters in France, um, do about 50 billion in sales. Um, but here in North America, um, our main brand is, is certainty. So if you've done any building or home renovations in the last few years during COVID times, you may be familiar with the certainty brand uh, where we make uh, wallboard, shingling, uh, roofing, um, siding, uh, fiberglass insulation, um, you name it. Um, that's what we operate in um, in North America. Um, but being Paris, uh, being French led and being in the buildings products company, as, as many are aware, um, sustainability is a huge part of our strategy. Uh, roughly 40% of emissions are tied to um, the building sector, either in the materials that we manufacture and go into buildings or in the operations uh, of those buildings themselves. So the products that we sell can make our, have embodied carbon embedded into them, but also you know, lead to the efficiency of those buildings themselves. Um, so this is just to show you know, that this is a, a part of our strategy um, growing impact, which is meant to point out that while our business is, seeks to grow, we need to reduce the impacts while doing so. Uh, we seek to be a, you know, a world leader in, in sustainable products that go into these buildings, all with the long-term goal of, of making the world a better home through our products and the services that we bring to the world. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so as a part of that strategy, as, as um, Paul mentioned, you know, like many organizations, we have the goal of being net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, we have interim goals um, along the way towards that. So what I show here is that we're reducing our, our operational emissions by 33% for scope one and two, but we also have a, a scope three goal as well um, to reduce that by 20 or by 16% um, by 2030 as well. Um, but then we also have goals for our products, as I mentioned, that we want to make sure that we're bringing the most um, en energy and, and uh, CO2 efficient products to the market while um, helping our customers you know, decarbonize you know, their buildings or, or whatever sectors we're, we're selling into. Go to the next slide for me, please. In addition to that, obviously, we have goals across um, these four pillars of sustainability. So we're not just uh, being good stewards of, of our carbon emissions, but also being good stewards of water, um, helping to, to drive towards a circular economy. We have an exciting new uh, business devoted specifically to that, to making sure that we're, we're being um, good stewards of the materials that we utilize and, and helping to, to create a more circular economy. And then on the product side of things, we're driving towards having uh, full LCAs for all of our products, again, understanding the embodied carbon there, driving that down, making sure that the products that we bring to market are as sustainable as possible. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, but coming back to um, the subject at hand here, carbon um, pricing. So this is a, a, a map from um, the World Bank that I think is, is important um, in highlighting that while most of the U.S. does not have carbon pricing, what you see here is that 
a lot of the world does, especially as a, a French run company, you, you can see that, you know, the European market where we have you know, a, a sizable footprint, um, most of it has um, carpet markets in play or carbon markets in development. Um, there's even, um, for those who may be aware, um, you know, new regulations around import taxes so that even if you don't have a carbon um, tax where you are, if you import into Europe, um, some of those materials will be taxed. Um, for, for their carbon intensity. So all of this you know, points to the fact that while it, it's not regulated um, everywhere, it impacts a lot of organizations and it, you know, it's a sizable part of, of the strategy. Um, so that's what really has led us to having a, a, a um, carbon tax and an internal price on carbon. So if you could go to the next slide, um, to make sure that you know, we're being smart and strategic across all of the networks that we play. In 2016, um, St. Cobain made the decision to set a, a internal price on carbon um, to make sure that we're being good stewards of, of the environment, of the emissions that we create, as well as to make sure that we're, we're being smart and strategic across all of our geographies um, in, in the projects that we're funding and the way we evaluate projects um, for their impact. Um, but as Paul mentioned in, in his intro, and as you can see from the graph here, um, when we look at the, the European market and other markets, pricing has, has changed since 2016. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that the prices have gone up since then. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're keeping up with, with those times. Um, and so earlier this year, if you can flip to the next slide, um, we had an adjustment to that pricing. Um, to make sure, uh, again, that we're, we're following the trends, we're keeping up with the European ETS, as well as other markets that impact California and Canada, uh, where we also um, have responsibility. And so what we're showing here is, is a range of different prices, but all of those staying in line with the carbon price in Europe and in other geographies. Um, but these are, are prices that impact um, our evaluations of acquisitions, our evaluations of capital projects, our evaluations of, of R&D products and projects in development. And the prices can, can vary across those um, depending on the impact of the project and, and, the, and the sort of um, phase that, that it is in. Um, but in addition to the updates in pricing to make sure that we're following the European ETS, there's also been um, adjustments to strategy that, that previously it was, you know, projects of, above a certain dollar threshold or um, that had emissions above a certain threshold or, or related to um, fuel switching. But at this point, you know, we're, we're looking at projects across all of these sectors, ensuring that, that the way we invest, the way we evaluate investments are keeping with, um, you know, the, the carbon emissions associated with those. So across all scopes, across all sectors, um, and making sure that we're, we're being uh, responsible and, and, and good stewards of the emissions associated with the way we run our business and the products that we bring to, um, to market. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Andy to go into a little bit more detail about the, the financial side of, of how we impact or how we implement this. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Blair. Um, you know, one thing I'll kind of state you know, that's kind of written down here at the bottom is across these three categories for when we're assessing acquisitions, when we're assessing CapEx um, decisions or R&D investments, um, you know, it, two of our models today that we use around these um, decisions, if carbon pricing and the internal carbon price is not factored in to the cost of that investment, um, the model will be returned, right? And so, um, it's becoming a much more kind of strict rule for our company, um, certainly in Europe, but even more so as we adopted here in North America, that if we don't factor internal carbon pricing into our financial models as it goes through approvals, um, if it's caught that it's not factored in, it'll be returned and you'll have to make sure it's factored in. So that's how strict we are getting here within Sankoban within North America, which is a good thing. Um, you can go to the next slide. So here's a little bit of the application um, that we use for uh, embedding internal carbon price into our decision. So bucketed into three groups here. Um, the first one being our R&D or new product development, um, you know, gate process. So we have a model, it's called our gate model. Um, it goes through five stages. Um, from kind of, you know, just idea development all the way through, hey, we're modeling in all the raw materials that are going to be included in this new product to, and then testing it on a production line, um, which would be in stage five. 
Um, within this model, we do have two internal carbon uh, prices, depending on the stage that that new product development is in. And so in the first stages, stages one through three, there's this hurdle rate. It's, it's a much higher carbon price. And basically we're you know, penalizing new product development that would have higher carbon emissions and applying a higher internal carbon price. Um, we didn't list that here, but you can kind of imagine that it's you know, almost double of what the European um, cap and trade price is. And that's you know, to make sure that we're making better decisions and the products that truly are reducing carbon are going to the top and coming to the front of the line to reach stages four and five. And then at stages four and five, we lower that internal carbon price um, you know, for the financial modeling. Um, and there's a little bit of a snapshot of it down below. Um, this is owned by product development and R&D with support from finance. Um, and it's more at the local level that we own this model here in North America. And then when it comes to acquisitions, the internal carbon price has been embedded in our Madison model when we're assessing new companies either to acquire um, that are adjacent to our industry or you know, just aligned with our strat strategy. Um, this was something that was relaunched in January of 2023 and now factors in our revised um, new carbon price. And this is a model that's owned globally. So it's kind of mastered out of our headquarters in France um, by our finance and strategy team there. And then anytime we have an acquisition here in North America, we are required to use this model. Um, and anytime we do not factor in the carbon emissions, it's gonna automatically be rejected and kind of resent back to the team that's uh, working on that M&A. And then last but not least, which is arguably where most of the um, action happens, right? As far as just a quantity of flow um, around making decisions on what to invest in. We have our internal rate of return model for all of our CapEx decisions. This tends to be more at the business unit level, oftentimes um, owned by a plant operations manager as well as the plant controller. Um, we use this today, but we're currently working on revamping it for a new launch in late this summer, just to make it easier for our plant controllers, our operation managers to update it, make it faster, but also make sure that they're factoring in their emissions that are associated with that CapEx investment. And hopefully those investments that are lowering emissions, using less energy, whatever that CapEx is, um, you'll get kind of a credit, right? Because we'll be factoring in some carbon emission savings that'll apply that internal carbon price to it. And it will make that investment look a little bit more attractive versus something that may be increasing carbon emissions. They will have a cost added to it. Um, and that's what the internal carbon price does. Um, so these are the three kind of channels that we use and the three different models that, that embed internal carbon prices. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of the, you know, tactical, what, what we're requesting in these models and just taking a look at R&D and the gate process model that we have. One of the key, you know, requests from our product management team was we need to keep it simple. We can't have these product managers entering all of these inputs and factoring in you know, changes over a 10 year time frame. And so we took that to heart and really there's only four new inputs for these product managers um, to estimate. And the first one is gonna be what the product emissions are for the new product that they're developing. And that's on a per unit basis. And then there's three additional inputs um, for the reference product or the old product that is being replaced or cannibalized by this new, better, shiny uh, product that we're looking to launch. And again, we request that they estimate and input that refer reference product's emissions. Relatively easy for us. Blair mentioned that um, you know, we're, we're heavily working on having 100% of our products have a life cycle assessment. In that process, you know what its embodied carbon is from a cradle to gate, um, you know, timeline perspective. 
So for our reference products, we can come up with that embodied carbon per unit pretty quickly. It's not a huge ask from our product managers. Um, and then the two other inputs is what was that reference product sales units last year? And then what do we anticipate that reference products growth rate to be? It's often a conservative one. It's not going to grow at any high rate because it's going to be replaced and cannibalized by the newer product. There are other inputs, obviously, within the model, but as it relates to CO2 emissions and the calculations that run through and, and apply the internal carbon price, this is it. There's four new ones for our product managers to touch. Um, next slide. So this is a little bit of a, an illustrative example. Um, I know it's a bit of an eye chart to look at, but conceptually I'll, I'll talk us through it. Um, you know, those four inputs, there's three of them highlighted on this spreadsheet. And essentially what gets calculated is what the unit sales would be for the new product as well as the existing product. And those are both multiplied per year by their carbon emissions per unit. So you can quickly come up with an estimate of what your total carbon emissions are at a gross level while both products are being produced um, and obviously emitting carbon as they're produced. But for the decision process, what we do factor in is what the net incremental CO2 expense or savings is. We're not factoring in the gross because we wanna be able to assess from a decision perspective, what this new product will bring either as a benefit, reduced carbon, or as a detriment, increased carbon. And if it's increasing carbon versus the baseline, right, it will be penalized. But if it's reducing carbon emissions versus the baseline, it will be um, you know, credited with potential carbon savings, right? And this is real for, for many of our, our manufacturing plants, specifically the ones that are in Canada um, and as well as the ones that we have in California. Um, so next slide, please. And then for CapEx. So similar you know, kind of concept here, but just a little bit of a different look. And, and we are requesting that when we are um, analyzing a project or a CapEx investment to make, the inputs are spread out over 10 years. Um, and we ask for, hey, what is the additional CO2 emissions that this investment's going to break, bring? If we are adding a new line to a plant and increasing our production, you're going to definitely have an additional CO2 emissions. We will penalize um, that investment and there will be added costs. But in most cases, what we hope is that our CapEx investments will have some level of decrease in carbon emissions. But there's gonna be scenarios where there's an increase and a decrease, and depending on the location of the plant, there could be free credits um, that would allow us to produce without being taxed. And you could enter those as well. But in the end, we take the net. What is the net change in our carbon emissions? And we multiply that by our um, internal carbon price. And there's no user input there. The model already has it factored in, whatever our internal carbon price is. And then in the end, it ends up getting baked into the PL model um, at the variable cost level. And so these are the ways that um, we model in internal carbon price into our a couple of our financial models. And I think that might be it from me, Paul. I think we put in one last slide here that it's more along the lines of a public announcement. Feel free to visit the website and you can see um, the internal carbon prices that we were using. Um, I will mention this is a little bit dated. I think this may have been around the 2019 year time frame and our carbon prices um, have changed in alignment with the uh, European uh, cap and trade program. That they have. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Blair. That's really terrific. Uh, uh, you know, you guys have obviously given a lot of thought to this. So um, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, uh, our next speaker, uh, Laura Jones of Commons. Laura uh, ha has been with Commons for 19 years in a variety of roles, from a site level facility engineer to, to a business segment and re regional facilities. And prior to her current role, Laura was part of 
of uh, the global facilities uh, functional excellent team, excellence team. And she, but she currently uh, serves as the director of eco efficiency, where she leads a team driving the efforts to reduce the environmental impacts of energy, water, and waste of Cummins operations worldwide. So please, uh, let's um, let's uh, turn it over to Laura, and she can tell us what they're doing in this area. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, you can go to the next slide. At Cummins, we are committed to making people's lives better by powering a more prosperous world, and we're continuing to advance that technology and power solutions that are essential to our future. Uh, we understand that strong communities and businesses depend on a healthier planet, and we also understand that we can't do it alone. Um, our Planet 2050 strategy is a long-range business strategy with an environmental lens. It uses actions, advocacy, and partnerships to do our part to drive a healthy planet. Our goals in this area are addressing climate change and air emissions, using natural resources sustainably, and partnering so that our communities are better because we're there. At Cummins, we set our first energy reduction goal in 2006, and we have continued to expand our sustainability strategy and goals since then. Uh, most recently, we have switched from an energy reduction focus to a greenhouse gas reduction focused goals. Uh, next slide. We have a total of nine goals for uh, 2030. The top three here are science-based initiatives goals. Um, and the very top one is for facilities and operations, 50% uh, reduction by 2030 with a baseline of 2018. And then we do have a couple for our product side um, for scope three and our products in use. Next slide. I just wanted to share kind of where our footprint is from a um, global perspective. As you can see, um, it's worldwide, but really primarily, you know, almost half of our emissions uh, from our facilities and operations are in North America. And for us, the North America region is the U.S. and Canada. And then our Latin America region is, is uh, Mex Mexico and South America. Next slide. So what we've done um, over the years is we've obviously studied our data to understand where our most impactful um, um, reductions could take place. And we're focused on these initiatives that we call critical X's to drive the strategy and execution of these goals. Um, we have a variety of goals and strategies, including adding renewable um, capacity in the market um, through our virtual power purchase agreement, um, which you'll see here. And then also through energy efficiency, whether that's with um, variable frequency drives or lighting improvements, um, compressed air is another big focus area for us. At Cummins, um, compressed air, energy to make compressed air is almost 30% of our electrical consumption. Um, so changing out to DC controls or DC tools is um, a big initiative right now. And then we also have um, on-site solar, uh, where we're focusing on um, getting to 10% of our electrical consumption on-site generation, and then advanced manufacturing, research and design, um, improving our and reducing our impact when we are manufacturing and when we're testing. Next slide. I just shared here a snapshot kind of similar to the previous presentation of our internal rate of return. Um, model that we have. We have a um, environmental tab that I've taken a snapshot here that helps us calculate um, the cost of carbon uh, for our financial analysis. So uh, we, we require all environmental projects or facilities and operations projects to complete this environmental section. Um, as you can see here, we've selected a pretty uh, modest um, $7 per metric ton of CO2 for those projects. Um, and it could be a positive or a negative depending on um, if you're adding capacity or uh, I think as the previous presenter said, hopefully in most cases, the net will be zero. So um, if you're replacing a manufacturing line, you're gonna be, you know, we have improved our standards to make those more efficient. So the new line will be a overall reduction um, to what it's replacing. Um, and it's really just added there as a, as a, a benefit to the, um, cost analysis. Um, we are in the process of evaluating this current cost. Um, 
in light of the regional regulation impacts, and you could see, um, you know, from our footprint, uh, we have a, a little bit in Europe, but um, definitely in some of those other markets that are um, becoming more and more regulated for carbon. So that's really how we apply it. I also wanted to mention that we also do a project prioritization, um, looking at the greenhouse gas impacts. So we use a CNE matrix to score and rank projects that are being funded. Um, we have a centralized um, capital fund for the globe uh, where we are um, uh, evaluating uh, greenhouse gas, water and waste projects against um, similar criteria. So we're looking at the energy and greenhouse gas impact. And you can see there where you can get the score of 931 based on what your impact is. We also look at the dollar invested per environmental benefit, in this case for greenhouse gas, and then the simple payback, um, of course. And so based on the CNE ranking um, that you get based on your project um, impacts, um, you'll get a score and you know we focus on uh, funding those top projects. Um, I just showed an example here of an investment, you know, 1.5 million for almost 2,000 metric tons. That would get a score of $700 uh, per metric ton invested. So that would get a score of a nine in our CNE matrix. Um, prior to 2030 goals, we were really targeting um, a $500 or less investment per metric ton saved. Um, obviously, with a lot of the low hanging fruit being being um, achieved. Now, at many of our sites um, over the years, we've had to raise that target, but we're still seeing really good paybacks. Uh, but that's just a couple of the ways that we use the internal rate of uh, or internal rate of return for our carbon cost, and then also ranking and and prioritizing our projects around greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. Uh, let's see. I want to uh, uh, introduce Sean next. He's going to be our final speaker from Comores. Uh, Sean is the uh, sustainability director, uh, technology director, sustainability technology director at Comores. Uh, he, he has over two decades, <coughs> excuse me, of experience in the chemical industry with deep experience in site operations, process development, and continuous improvement activities. In his role, Sean works collaboratively with Comor's three businesses, their, their titanium technologies, thermal and specialized solutions, as well as the advanced performance materials. And he does this in a way that uh, helps to ensure that the company continues to lead in sustainability and is well positioned for the future. So let's, uh, let's uh, take it away, Sean, You're, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I'm from the Comores company. You can go ahead and go to the, the next slide. Um, we're a chemistry company, a medium-sized chemistry company, about 7,000 employees and $7 billion in revenue. Um, we're driven by our purpose to create a better world through the power of our, our chemistry. As Paul mentioned, we have three main business segments, titanium technologies, thermal and specialized, specialized solutions, and advanced performance materials. Um, we're heavily invested in sustainability. Um, you know, many of our products are, are used to advance sustainability in society. Some of the examples are low GWP refrigerants uh, from the TSS business and APM. Um, our IXM product line enables the production of green hydrogen, um, you know, also uh, to support the electric vehicle productions and, and others as well. In 2018, we announced uh, 10, you know, pretty bold goals in this area to bring responsible chemistry uh, to life by, by 2030. Um, if you go to the, the next slide, I'll, I'll hone in on a couple of those. Uh, for decarbonization, our goal is to reduce absolute greenhouse gas emissions from operations by 60% uh, by 2030 on our way to net zero by, by 2050. Um, like a lot of companies, the three segments that, that we work in to do that are emissions reduction, renewables, um, and energy efficiency to achieve that. Um, and carbon pricing is one important component that we use in, in these projects. Um, if you go to the, the next slide, I'll start uh, talking through that. So background on you know why implement, we've heard a lot of that from St. Gobain and, and Cummins as, as well. Um, of course, we have ambitious sustainability and, and growth goals. 
Um, we have a direct decarbonization goal, as I mentioned, but also needed a tool to really inform our strategy and investment decisions and also to drive process and, and product innovation. Um, and, you know, also has been covered earlier, there's a lot of current and future regulation expectations um, in this as well. Our basis is, is fairly simple. Um, you know, we do derive a, a single price uh, carbon price that we use in, in all of our existing financial systems um, that we had, uh, the way we approach this, and we first established this in, in 2018, and, and I would say we've improved every year on on how we use that and, and when we use that. Today, we use it in you know, almost all of our financial analysis um, that we do for any business planning activities. Uh, but we use a weighted average. Uh, we select a, a moderate case. Um, and it's a weighted average of, of future carbon pricing across the regions where our businesses operate. Um, and I put a link in here um, as to the basis that we use from the International Energy Agency uh, that they publish on carbon price projections. Uh, that's one major input. And then we also uh, true that up and, and review actual and historical data from, from World Bank as well. And I put a reference in that um, also. Our corporate team, we analyze and update that price or consider updating that price once annually um, as needed during our standard strategy processes um, as a company. And, and the current price that we have on, on the basis that I just shared is uh, $41 per metric ton of, of CO2E is but what's being used today in the financial analysis as we, as we speak. Go to the, the next slide, I'll get into a little bit more on how we use it. Um, as I mentioned, we use a new product development and innovation. We also follow a stage gate process and we use it um, in that process, similar to how St. Gobain had announced it as well and how they use it. Also in capital investment decisions, um, when you look at uh, expansion cases, of course, as part of strategy sessions, we would use carbon pricing in that. Um, I would also make note that, you know, we make use of that carbon footprint number also to incorporate that into our greenhouse gas goal roadmaps um, as well, because our goal is absolute. Um, if we do expansions and, and changes, we have to be able to um, offset any new footprint in another way in our, in our company. So we always incorporate any expansions and things like that into our roadmap. Uh, it's also used in the improvement categories that I mentioned uh, that we're going after energy efficiency, emissions reductions, and, and renewables. If we get into, you know, simple um, equipment replacements and there's decisions on, you know, this one's more energy efficient than that one, we would use it in those calculations in that small um, case. Um, we also would use it to assess, yeah, low carbon technology within existing processes as well. And, you know, as I said, we used a lot of our existing financial systems and just plug this in as a new input as a positive or a negative um, into assessing any investment that we do as a company. Uh, so that's simply how we how we use it. And so I'll, I'll wrap up there and, and turn it back to Paul. Thanks, Sean. That was great. Appreciate your remarks there. And so we've, we've heard from all three presenters now. And, and so uh, we, we want to get into some of the Q&A because uh, there's some interesting uh, topics that have come up uh, that we've seen uh, through the Slido. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's see. So uh, I think I'm going <clears> to <throat> we'll start. Uh, there, there was uh, the, one of the first questions was, uh, you know, what what is exa exactly is meant by uh, internal carbon pricing? And um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and see if the panelists want to add anything. But uh, and that's a great question because I don't think we defined it up front. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the the idea is that if you're not in one of the regulated markets, you know, and you you have a facility that's emitting carbon, uh, you know, CO2 or other forms of uh, CO2e, that that there's essentially no cost to that, and you can emit a lot or a little, and you would still pay the same price. Uh, unless you were in one of those regulated markets. Now, if you do an energy project, there would likely be some cost savings associated with it or other projects. You know, if you if you have a refrigerant leak and you can remedy that, then you'll, you'll reduce, you know, the, the cost of the refrigerant. But those costs can vary with those markets and not necessarily tie to reaching your GHG goals or the broader goals of, you know, tying with uh, other carbon goals. So, 
So, uh, so the idea behind an internal carbon price is to, to have a price that, that equates that and, and ties with your efforts of achieving your goals as well as harmonizes across your region so that certain plants in, in the regulated footprint don't pay a price and others, uh, um, or the regulated ones pay a high price and others don't pay any price. So hopefully that, address, I, I, the panelists may want to add anything to that. Okay, let's take that was well described. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, let's go on uh, the uh, the next topic. Uh, let's see. Can you advise how you get scope one three through ac for acquisitions? Uh, we can't seem to get that uh, to be able to get that during the acquisition process on time. Just estimates is a question. And then if yes, what service are you using? So uh, I know I know Blair and, and Andy, you guys went into that a little bit. Yeah, maybe you could uh, take that one on and then and then Laura and Sean could jump in. Yeah, I can take a first pass at that. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, if anyone else from the panel wants to elaborate, feel free. Um, you know, I, I'd say the, the first way is, is simply asking, right? Um, it depends on the company that that's targeted, right? And how advanced they are in tracking their um, utility usage and how well they are at tracking their raw material usage and their inputs. But the first way is simply to ask, right? As part of that due diligence process, um, and depending on how transparent they, they want to be, they, they could simply provide it. Um, and that could be through uh, a third party investment bank as well. Um, so that's the first way. Um, the, the other thing I wanna mention is you, you did ask scopes one through three, um, you know, full transparency in our acquisition model that we use called the Madison model. Um, we only require scopes one through two. There's a scope three line in there that is optional um, because that's the one that's incredibly difficult to to one get our hands on and and difficult to estimate right for your suppliers what is our your suppliers impact um, for carbon emissions so really the focus is on scopes one and two um, but then after that right if you can't get that information directly from the target or the acquisition target. Um, you know, we, we could estimate it. And, you know, we've got plenty of folks, you know, Blair included, that could probably within a pretty good ballpark estimate what that company's, um, you know, emissions are based on their plant's size, um, how many plants they have, the size of them, and then the electrical grid that those locations uh, for those plant sites sits on. So, and, you know, most of the time for Sankoban, we're acquiring companies that are similar to us, right? Um, they're, they're manufacturing gypsum wallboard. And so we have a really good understanding of um, the raw materials and the carbon emissions that, that it takes to produce gypsum wallboard. So, um, you know, we can estimate probably within a 10 to 15% range uh, of accuracy. So okay. thank you, Andy. That's perfect. Uh, I, I, Laura and Sean, I don't know if you, you guys want to add anything to that. Okay, and no, then, I thought that was well covered. The the only thing I would add there is that as you're, you know, we approach it similarly, really focus on scope one and two and work to estimate three in that case. But there are good external databases that can be used to um, better estimate some of the raw material inputs and other scope three things as you get interested in that. And we certainly make use of those when the, you know, the company's not aware or haven't calculated their own. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. And I know, um, the, there was a question below that the third one on the screen that Laura addressed uh, through the Slido. So, so we, we can uh, skip that one. And I want to go to the second question next. Uh, you know, to, to the panelists, I think we'll start with Laura. You know, when, when you look at your carbon prices as being, you know, subjective to some degree, but you also want to avoid making, you know, probably avoid making a lot of adjustments due to market conditions. Kind of how do you stay the course and how, how do you keep that you know, updated, but yet at the same point, not not uh, as volatile as the markets are. Yeah, with ours, I mean, it is it is kind of on that low end that you shared earlier, and we established it a few years ago, and just we haven't, you know, we've just left it at that, and just kind of putting our toes in the water, I guess, if you will. And like I said, we need to reevaluate it now with the current markets, um, and we're in that process. Um, 
yeah, I feel I feel like once you set something though, it's it's it needs to be stable and set and not changed to to fluctuate with the with the markets, um, depending. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. And any any you want, Sean or or Blair? Do you want to add anything to that? And then then we got a. Uh, I think we're going to need to wrap up. Um, yeah, I was going to say our process, as I mentioned it during the the call, we look at it annually. Agree, it needs to be a hopefully a more stable number, not jumping around. And um, it has changed over over time, but uh, has stayed relatively stable with that annual. Perfect. Awesome. So with that, I think I'd like to thank our panelists for, you know, these are great uh, presentations on the topic and a, a range of perspectives. And I think it really gave us some insight into how, how you can make this internal carbon price work for you, uh, but some of the things you might consider in doing so. Um, so feel free to contact our presenters directly. You know, we, we have their emails up uh, in, in the slide deck. Um, I wanted to give a quick plug to <clears throat> our next uh, a webinar in the summer series, building trust with homeowners and renters, and and looking at the home energy score. Uh, so that's going to be coming up on on June 27th here, um, and then encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and Twitter. And then you'll you as I mentioned before, you will be receiving an email notice about the uh, the the today's recording when that's going to be available on the Solution Center. Um, so. Uh, Thank you, everyone, and let's. You know, I'd like to give a, a round of virtual applause to our presenters and um, thank their thank for their time today.